recording. Okay. All right, so um, let's let's go. On. So I I, only, I I did not manage to cover the like ten slides, which is not too bad. So I spent a few times to um, finish that part off. Not all of it, but what I still want to finish, and then we will move on to the to the, the half part of the lecture. So now you know about object properties, you know about data properties, you know uh, about the things you can say on the, on, on, on the abstract side, you know about things you can say on the data side. So the last, the last bit of expressivity of how to, which I still want to cover, is the thing called keys. So keys is something that you should be familiar with from your database experience. So keys let you identify individuals. So you, can, you can say, okay, if two people have the same name uh, and date of birth, then they are the same. Or if they have the same tax identification number, then they are the same. So there are means of identifying that two people are actually the same person. So how would you do that in our since so far we've not seen the concept of a key. So if you want to identify two objects, two individuals, based on the values of their object properties, so one thing you can do, you can declare a certain property as inverse functional. So you can say, okay, as name is the inverse functional property. So what, what that means? That means if, if, if uh, two people are connected um, to the same uh, name by the has name properties, then they are the same. Okay, and then we go to So, for object property, for object properties, you can do that. Uh, the problems with this approach is that, first of all, global inverse functionality make it too strong of notion. So, it's pretty clear that uh, there are there's more than one person in the, in the world who has the same name, same date of birth, but just the same name. So what, what if you just want to say that if you're, if you're in the Griffin family, then inside the Griffin family, the name is the key. There are no two members of the Griffin family with the same name. And then the problem is that, okay, I'm not on, the object, on the object side, you can do that because we have inverse functional object properties. We don't have inverse functional data properties. Uh, they have been excluded from the standard because the implementation is pretty difficult. So, so to help with this situation, in how to there is notion of the key. So there's a new kind of axiom, and the last kind of axiom in my talk for today. It's uh, open form has key. So you, you can say that if two named instances of the expression CE all agree on the values of object properties, on main values of object properties, OP1 to OPM, and they all agree on their values of their data properties, then they are the same. So you can say, okay, if two members of the Griffin family agree on their name, they are the same. So the data the list of data properties in this case is empty. Or you can say for the whole domain which we are modeling, if two objects have the same tax identification number, which is a data property, supposedly it maps uh, every it maps some it maps instances of the abstract domain to some um, alpha numeral strings. If two people have the same tax ID, they are the same person. That's, that's what government usually try to ensure, even though it fails in some situation, but at least the intention is that you should be able to identify people by the tax ID numbers. Okay, and at this point, I believe I covered <coughs> all of the logical part of all to which I wanted to cover. And uh, so we see examples of both object property, object uh, axioms and data axioms. So I'm going to skip the extra logical part and move to the second part of the lecture. Right.
So the, that was the basis. <laughs> now, now we're moving to beyond the basis to something which is not necessarily more complicated, just not the basis. So you may have noticed that I've not spoken about reasoning at all up to now. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to speak a lot about reasoning because we've seen that before lunch. I will just say a few words just to remind you because I will move into the area where reasoning is trickier uh, and has certain different properties. I will speak about the relationship with Al and our dear in a bit more detail. So I don't really expect you to understand every single bit of that thing because it's not easy, but you need to understand that there is a relationship. The relationship is made precise in a specific way. And if you ever encounter a uh, use case where you need to understand that, means you know where to go and read about that stuff. And then, in the last part of the lecture, hopefully I will make it there, we will speak a little bit about modeling trickiness. So tomorrow we will have a lecture about modeling, and you will, know, you will hear a lot about positive examples of our modeling. So I will speak more about situation where things are not easy. So, and then and my intention is to help you recognize those situations if you ever need to do our modeling uh, as a part of your professional service. So it's it's a it's a it, it's a good quality to be able to recognize that okay if I if I need to model that then things are going to get hard so maybe maybe we should you know deviate from that path earlier sooner than later so that's what I'll try to do so I'll speak about end predicates I'll speak about map modeling and uh, integrity constraints and if I have time which I doubt probably will not but we might move into the now pain points of our modeling modeling time and so. Okay, but first of all, I want to remind you about reasoning. So what you all know that reasoning is the process of inferring implicit truth from explicitly stated information. So you have explicitly stated facts and schema items, and they might imply something which is not stated explicitly, but through reasoning you can uncover those hidden truths. And the reason we need reasoning, the reason people spend so much time designing reasoning algorithms and languages with specific properties uh, is because uh, reasoning helps, really, in practice. It helps uh, to ensure certain quality of ontologies. So reasoning helps to detect errors as you model. So for example, when people model native knowledge and they, they, they invoke the reasoner to make sure that, that the taxonomy of diseases or taxonomy of risk factors or taxonomy of any other things actually corresponds to what they believe the taxonomy should be or if they, they, if they see the, the concept that say pneumonia is inconsistent which means that there cannot be an instance of disease pneumonia which is nonsense that they, they can see okay we, we've done something wrong let's go back and reason why, why we have this uh, inference so reasoning is helpful for integrating data so when, when you merge ontologies come from different sources and lots of ontologies out there are actually overlap. So it's not the case that there's only one single ontology for every piece of the world. So there's no partition of the world into a subset of each covered by its own ontology. It's not the case. Like for, for chemistry you have lots of ontologies. For biology you have like gene ontology, plant ontology, they overlap. And, and if you need to integrate all that, Quite often the case that people disagree on what way. So a, a biologist might not disagree with a chemist, or a chemist might disagree with a with a medical person, and, and then you see that things do not align, and reasoning uncovers those things as well for you. And it's helpful for deployment. So uh, when you actually use ontology to do something with your data, and the data somehow violates the structure of the intended structure of the data which is by the ontologist, then, then, then you can see why, what, what goes wrong. We need to adjust the schema, we need to mess up the data. Okay, so this we know already. So in typical reasoning problems in DL now, so given an ontology, you can ask the reasoner whether it is consistent, so whether 
you actually, it actually has any interpretation at all, or there is a strong contradiction somewhere which just you know prevents you from doing any sort of reasoning. You may ask whether ontology entails an axiom. Does it entail a human or not? You may check for entailments which are desirable, entailments you want to get, and you check that those entailments you don't want actually do not follow. Uh, classification is a, a canonical reasoning problem which is inferred the class assumptions between every pair of named classes where this assumption holds. And it's query answering, uh, which can be uh, DL query, so you have protege there is a tab called DL query. So, so what it helps, what it allows you to do is to query for instances of class expressions or object property expressions, maybe. But I'm not sure about that, 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 that last thing. So people actually neglect that uh, capability quite often because it seems like it's not much you can do. Well, you can just query for instances of a class. But since it allows you to query for instances of any class expression, and how it's quite expressive in what kind of class expressions you may, you may create, that's actually quite powerful. So you can actually query for the in all instances which are both person and uh, uh, and Peter is their father. Should, should be able to infer Stu, Meg, and, and, and Chris as, as, um, as an instances of this class expression. And there are also conjunctive queries, which are slightly more powerful, but you're going to hear about that tomorrow. So Ro Roman will talk about the data uh, stuff, and I'm sure he'll talk conjunctive queries. So here I'm going to say a few words about decidability. And why we why we care about side the reasoning, kind of, at least some people do. Um, so I was based on twenty something years of strict logic research, maybe yeah, more than twenty. And a lot of time was spent by a lot of people thinking how to design practical decision procedures. So not just the procedures which are theoretically sound and complete and always terminate but those which can be implemented and which can be applied to realistic amounts of data to interesting use cases. And uh, if you want to guarantee that it's a decision procedure, so there is an algorithm which will always return like yes or no, if yes, if axiom follows from that ontology, no, if it doesn't follow from that ontology. If you want a strong guarantee on that, on, 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 on that then it means you have to restrict your language in certain ways. And, uh, and this is still a point where people debate whether we actually need to care. Because one argument is, well, you know, if we're still like double exponential, uh, so do we care about still being decidable? Or maybe, or maybe it's too bad anyway. What's the difference if, between the reasoner guaranteeing that it will return the answer in a finite amount of time? Because that, that finite amount of time might be pretty close to the heat, heat depth of the universe. Or reasoner without no guarantees at all. Is there, is there any difference there? Well, you, if, you, if you go and search on how people debate, you'll see different opinions on that. But uh, the experience has been that for uh, practical purposes, if you have a decision procedure, it's typically easier to implement and, and, and optimize. And it, it makes things symmetric. Like, for example, in first order logic, it's semi decidable So if something follows, you will going to entail it. If something does not follow, you can, you know, your reasoner will keep turning forever and you, you don't know without the answer. So see, there's no symmetricity between those two situations. So if you have, if you need to check for entailment, for, like, or for something which follows, or something does not follow, you need to distinguish those two situations. But not in our, not in the, in the decidable language. So there are still advantages uh, of decidability. And, uh, uh, and yes, you need uh, the important point that if you care about about your reasoning not being decidable, then semi decidability actually does not suffice because if you if you have a look at the pro at the at the reduction of your entailment reasoning problem to the consistency reasoning problem, you will see that axiom is entailed if certain class expression is not satisfiable. 
So if it's a sensibility on the same disciple, well, then a talent is not a disciple. And the other way around. So symmetricity breaks. So we want things disciple. That's basically the take home message of all this of, of, of what I told you. Okay. And after that, I will move to the area where things can be identifiable. And uh, and, 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 and try to present, uh, first of all, my view on all that and why you may actually step into that dark side of things. <coughs> okay, so now we go back to the question how OWL and RDF actually relate. So we have a statement, OWL is based on RDF. All uh, everywhere you can, you can find that. Well, maybe these days it's less than that, but like five, seven years ago, this semantic web stack was like in every single paper in the semantic conference. You would, on, on, the first, on, on the first page of the paper, you would see a stack of semantic web technologies. And there will, there will be OWL right on top of RDF in them. So what, what that, that actually means, I'll try to explain. So there is a precise notion in which every single OWL ontology which is, as you remember, is a collection of T-box axioms and A-box axioms, or just a collection of axioms, can be translated into an RDF graph, which is a collection of triples. So RDF syntactically is an extremely simple language, a lot easier than now. Now we have all those constructs, right? In RDF, what we have are triples, like subject, predicate, object. That's all we have. They can come from different namespaces, identify with different URIs, but syntactically, the only syntactic construct we have is the triple. So, and if you want to operate with all colleges with the graphs, you can do that. You can, the step defines exactly how this should be done. So, every axiom, so since RDM is so simple, we cannot code for a one to one correspondence between axioms and triples. So what happens in practice, every axiom is mapped to a set of triples, and every class expression is mapped to a set of triples. For one triple for simple expressions, generally a set of triples. Same for properties. So I'll give you an example of how that works. So entities, named classes, named properties, and indi named individuals are all mapped to nodes in the RDA graphs. The data values, like strings, integers, <coughs> Day times, they amount to something called the literal. That term comes from XML. And the uh, class of property expressions and axioms are mapped to set of triples. Just to give you an example of how this looks, which is pretty horrible, and all work can get horrible in many cases, is that look look at this class expression. Class expression which says which which, which describes the concept of all object who have real whose all relatives are the Griffins. Since all you have is triples, you will have to translate that into set of triples. So what you do, you say, okay, I use blend nodes as a as a as a um, unnamed member of that complex class. And uh, I have uh, RDF resources which are used to uh, sort of convey the meaning of this construct. So in the standard of RDF, uh, there's nothing, no resource comes from the OWL namespace. But to faithfully represent an OWL ontology, you need an extra vocabulary. Those, those are from the OWL namespace. So you say, okay, so um, we have something which is null restriction, and that null restriction is on the property as a relative, and uh, the exact the specific restriction is, is, is uh, and, and, and the filler should come from the Griffiths. So what about the semantics? How do you interpret that thing, uh, that set of triples? So you know how to interpret an axiom. An axiom has nice model theoretic interpretations. So you know you would map Griffiths to a set, you would map has a relative to a relation, you would know, you know what the interpretation of all values from uh, as relative driven mean. But now it's a collection of triples that is scattered all over our DF document. 
how do you top of that? So the thing is, RDF is its own world of theoretic semantics. So, which does not, which, which does not care whether an actual idea graph is an idea graph uh, produced from an old topology, or it's just a some idea. Like people uh, in the other room, they what they do, they create idea documents, they upload them to wikis. Those are typically valid idea documents. They should be. They should. They, those are interpreted in exact same way <coughs> as the, or at least according to the same model as the idea document, which are produced from old topologies. So, I will spend some very little time showing this semantics. So, good thing about it is it's also model theoretic. So, you will see similarities to the direct semantics, to the description logic semantics. So, you still more, you still have interpretation functions which maps syntax, syntactic construct to the objects of real world. You will still gonna have that. That this is just standard in, in, in semantic technology. So let's have a look at this idea graph. So we have nodes, Stewie, Lois, and Person. We, we, we say that, okay, Stu um, uh, is, is related to Lois via SP Helen, and Lois is related to the node Person via uh, the standard trading without any type. So basically what we can code here is two assertions. We have property assertions that Stu and Lois are related through a parent relationship. That, that would be just an object property assertion in our syntax. And that would be just a class membership assertion for Lois. We say that Lois is a person. Okay? Now, how, how would we interpret that in our DF? So the first, the first step is simple and should be familiar to you because you know what the model theoretic semantics is. Or should know. So we have an uh, interpretation function which maps with Stewie to an object of the Real world, and we have Lois uh, meant to Lois. So the, 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 the name uh, no, Lois meant to the real woman or picture. So that's part of something. Now we need to interpret this note. And if we were in DL, we would have uh, an extension of the class as a set directly. Right, that's how description logic semantics is. Classes are interpreted as sets. In RTL, it becomes indirect. Lois is first mapped to an object, or this person is first mapped to an object. So class is mapped to, to a specific object. And then that object is expanded or extended to, that, to its actual interpretation, which is a set. So here I need to immediately explain why this level of interaction happens. So what this allows us to do, this object, which you can think of as an identity element for the set, as, as, a, as, a, as an element which identifies the concept person. What it allows us to do, we can speak about the concept person as if it was a name, as if it, if it was a named object. So we can say person is something else. But we don't just have, in, in DL, we'd be able to say just person is a subclass of something, or person is disjoint with something, or person is equivalent to something else. But in RDL, we can actually make statements about classes as if they were individuals. This is informal, but you will see later why it's important. So the rest, so that's the first difference from the direct semantics. The rest is the predicates, and predicates go through a similar level of interaction. They are all they are first mapped into the identity elements, and then extended into relations. So this one is mapped into a relation which connects Stewie and Lois, and this one is is, is extended into a relation which connects Lois and Person. So, I don't expect you to actually get all of, all of that understand in detail. I just want you to, to keep in mind that there are differences. Although you see analogies, but there are differences. And there is a reason why those differences are there, because the founding fathers of RDF wanted a certain degree of freedom. They wanted to be able to say, they wanted to be able to use any concept, class, property, or individual, 
as a subject in their statements. They want to be able to say things like RTF type is RTF type, RTF type, RTF property. Like RTF type is something which is, an, which is, which is a property. We can't do that now. We can do it now here yeah, through this kind of interpretation. So, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip this. So, the interesting question now is that since we're given our ontology, there are two different ways of interpreting that. First of all, you can interpret it as, as, as was explained yesterday as a description logic knowledge base with description logic semantics. That would be one way. Or you can take it as a, uh, or you can map it to the RTF graph, interpret that RTF graph as a, uh, according to the RTF semantics, and use that. So if you, if you have multiple ways of interpreting the same piece of syntax, then the natural question is whether those ways are good. And what do you mean by good? So just to give an example. So for example, tomorrow someone like Bijan decides that he doesn't apply the scripture logic anymore. He wants to do RTF. And not the RTF. RTF is cool. And our well, and, and the scripture logic is not so cool. So what he so instead of instead of using standard DL reasoners, he goes off and implements an RTF based reasoner. So he will take every other ontology map to RDF, work with RDF and do entailment based on an RDF graph. Well, well someone else does that. I know it's one person who does that. So the question is, if they do that and I still do description logic by my favorite reasoner, are we going to entail the same answers? Or are we going to disagree? Because if I mean to disagree, then we defeat the whole purpose of of uh, you know modeling or good deal of the purpose of modeling semantic web. Because you remember in the, in the beginning of the first lecture, I told you that it's important that different applications agree on interpretation of terms. Now, let's say one application interprets interprets our ontologies RTF documents, does reasoning on RDF, entails something. Another application does reasoning using DL reasoner according to different semantics, infers something else. If that something else is different from what the RDF guys infer, then, then we are in the exact same situation as if we were if we did not do any semantic stuff at all. Misinterpretation happens again. So, it turns out that we are going to write the same answers. And this is a vast order simplification of the actual statement uh, in this spec. So, you know, some people spend a good chunk of their lives figuring out those problems and trying really hard to make sure that those we do not disagree if we do it according to DL semantics or RDF semantics. It's an incredibly hard job. But there is a theory now in the spec which says basically, okay, we have two RDF graphs, which are actually our ontologies, but just map to RDF. So if we uh, if one um, if we map them back out. Yes. So uh, then, if one entails another under the DL semantics, then it's necessarily true that the original RTL graph will entail that other RTL graph. So it doesn't matter in certain respect in which, which, how you do your entailment. You're going to get the same conclusions. If those are con if those conclusions are the answers, I'll have to make this. I'll have to say this because. So what it essentially means is that if someone does reasoning on idea and entails something which is a valid our axiom, like I am a human or male is a human, then I'm going to get the same axiom by the by deal. Alright, so why, why, why am I talking about all that stuff? Because that stuff is not easy. Uh, and, 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 uh, and all the people who really understand all the intricacies of that correspondence would probably be possible to fit them all in this room. I, I, I would say. I might be wrong with that, but that would be my you know, wide guess. So, uh, the reason I'm talking about all that, because I'll show you later that there are certain things which you will be able to do under the RDL way of modeling, which you cannot do in our DL kind of model. But before that, uh, let me ask another question. So you now, you now know that an ontology can be mapped to a DL graph. 
and then we define from a semantic point of view. We're not going to uh, not going to train a wrong and we do things in other. But what about the other way? Can we take an arbitrary RDA graph from web? There are lots of those and interpret that RDA graph as an album touch. Because that's my that's maybe how we want to do things. We like working with how, we hate RDA, and there's a piece of RDA out there on web. And we'll oh, okay, so maybe I'll just take that piece of RDA out and then just map it back into OWL and I'll, and I'll have my nice little OWL ontology. I know how to deal with OWL, I can load it into Protege, uh, I can classify it, I can do justification analysis, I can do module instruction. Lots of things you can do with OWL which you cannot do in RDA. Can you do it in all cases? Can you go back from RDA into OWL? Well, and the answer is if you if you want to decide a language in which, which, in which an ontology is a collection of all axioms, then uh, no. There are RDA documents out there which are not RDA ontologies. But, um, and there are a few reasons why it's not true, because as I said before, RDA people can make statements which are not valid all axioms. You can say that a uh, person as a class is is a member of someone else. That's that's not a valid our action, but they can say that. Uh, or they can say like RDF type, RDF type, RDF type, perfectly valid RDF uh, uh, syntax, but not. That. But even if you can map every piece of RDF in, into ours, even if you can parse it fully as a set of our ontologies, uh, as a set of our actions. That's going to go outside the decidable uh, fragment of the first order logic. So as you know, first order logic is undecidable. There are certain ways of characterizing the decidable part of first order logic, and that is not going to fit in there. So now the decidable fragment is called LDL, L2DL, by and large. Uh, well, there. You can you can still extend it a little bit uh, and still be decided. Marcus will talk about that maybe tomorrow. But up to first approximation, to we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it's, it's not usually important. It, it, it's a bit of a fine approximation to say that our DL is the largest decidable uh, fragment of our. It's not 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 strictly speaking true, but but oh, not true. It's the largest defined fragment. Yeah, yeah. Right. that's a good point. Well, yes, okay, but. But that's that's the largest defined decidable fragment of all. And what's the rest is the dark side of all pool, which is a very expressive and undecidable. Um, okay. So now the question is, if you have an L, if you have an L ontology, how do you know if that L ontology is an L to DL or an L to four? Can you do reason, reasoning with it or you just you know, give up immediately? So it's uh, well, we can sort of say, okay, if it's, if it's, if it's decidable and it's not to DL, it's not decidable, it's not full, but it, that's not that's not that's not how it can be checked, right? We need a syntactic restriction, uh, we need a syntactic condition which would help us determine, well, not us, but reasoners and APIs, help them determine if we can do stuff um, with ontologies, or we just say, okay, I'm decidable, right. I think it's, it, it's in the language we do not support. So I'll quickly go through the certain syntactic restrictions which you have to meet in order to be in DL, in order to be able to do useful stuff with your own problems. So first of all, you cannot use the built-in uh, constructs uh, in, as, as, as named entities, as named classes or individuals or properties. So for example, um, entities from the RDL of our RDFS namespace cannot appear as classes or individuals. Um, first of all, you have to be careful about data types. So I showed you that data types, just as class expressions, can be union, can be uh, intersected, can be you have to take a complement, you can combine them. So in pretty much the same way as class expressions, except there are certain things you are not allowed to do. And one of them is cycles. Uh, so on, on an object level, we can say that a person um, is someone who has a parent with a person. So this loopy definition uh, of, of, of a person 
this is syntactically valid uh, construct because we're talking about classes. Yeah. Do you insist? Um, restrictions on data checks aren't for decidability purposes. Okay, but they are still there. They're still there. So technically, you're still outside the DL, you can pop it for later. Absolutely. Yes. On the, yes, not, not every restriction is there to ensure decidability. Some of them, a lot of reasons for ease of implementation or ease of understanding, but they are there. Technically, the reason that we have the restrictions on the data types are to allow us to combine ontologies with different sets of data types without having to be coordinated. No, okay. So it's, okay. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's to make it more flexible. You restrict the expressivity of what you can say in, in any ontology so that you can combine ontologies and get a monotonic behavior in the, in the Okay. That, that's another reason. So when we define our data types, we cannot say we cannot define data types in terms of themselves, directly or indirectly. We cannot say that, um, so while we can say that uh, a tax number um, of an ID is a union of tax number and alternative tax number, both of which are data types, we cannot de define ID in terms of ID somewhere here or tax number in terms of tax number or something like that. So the, so the set of values which data types has to be known determined exactly without referring to the same data type. So no cycles there. Um, another thing, so the last set of restrictions I will cover is an object properties. So first I need to define what I mean when I say a property, an object property is complex. So properties can be complex or simple. And um, well, I'm not going to do it formally, but Informally, you can think of a complex object property if assertions for that property can be inferred from other property assertions. Again, directly or indirectly. So if you're going to be able to infer that I am a, uh, I have a relative, not because it's stated explicitly, but because some other people declare their relatives and relationships to me, then as a relative is probably is, is, is a complex property. So complex properties in, uh, include the top object property by definition and those properties which occur on the right, right hand side of the chain. So for example, we have, uh, if you have a chain, oh okay, we have a chain here. We say that the composition of SPR and his brother is uncool, implies uncool, that makes uncool a complex property. And then if we use another property as a super property, for example, like relative. If, you, if, if, if someone is my uncle, then someone is my relative. And his uncle is already complex, then by building something on top of uncle, it's, it's going to be complex too. And uh, the important thing is the complex properties are not allowed to occur in, 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 in the certain kinds of axioms, most notably called null restrictions. And I'm not going to explain you why. Because, because again, the, people who do DL theory, they investigate it carefully what happens if you allow those things. And they identified some, uh, what, what the consequences might be and how exactly this breaks the sidability. But this is not what I'm after today. I'm just saying that if you have a comp uh, one implication of having a complex option property that you cannot have not the restriction of that property. So if you have rel as relative is a complex, then you cannot say you cannot say that the concept of all people have exactly two relatives. Or if loves is a complex property by virtue of being transitive. So because remember, transitivity is basically a chain, right? So the statement uh, that loves is transitive is the same as saying that loves Composed with loss implies loss. Okay, so that makes loss non uh, simple, complex. Then we also cannot uh, uh, use it in the Haskell restrictions. So, finally, the final bit of restrictions, and the most complicated one, is on property hierarchies. So, it's also unfortunately the case that property hierarchies, which you build by asserting uh, some properties as some properties of others, 
um, it cannot be arbitrary. There are certain restrictions on that. To define that, that condition, I will need to use the notion of reflex transitive closure and properties. So how many of you still remember what the transitive closure means from this set theory? Okay, good marks. I, I, I never had any doubt about this. Transitive closure. But did you at least, are you at least uh, recalling the thing being defined in some, in, in some, in your past? So basically, the transitive closure, if you have a relation, the transitive is a mechanic. Okay, well, I'm not a reflexive transitive closure yet. I'm, 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 trying, I'm trying to get people to recall just transitive closure first before we come to the reflexive transitive closure. At least, at least the term does not freak you out. You can remember that that thing was explained at some point, and you, at that point, you were able to understand it. Right. Is that is that is that true? Okay. So for those for those who still don't remember, um, if you have a relation, then the transitive closure of that relation would be basically then, but without giving the definition, you need to uh, explicitly. So it would be a minimal relation which contains all the implicit uh, pairs. So if this thing is transitive, like if you, you can go from A to B and B to C, that means it, you can still go, you can also go from A to C, so let's, let's set it explicitly. And to, to here as well. And to here as well. That would be the, the closure. Are you okay with that, everyone? Okay, fine. All right. So. Um, and so the reason we need that we need to define the transitive closure on um, on a sort of axis, right? On a sort of subproperty absence. And then we say that okay, my property hierarchy is regular, which means allowed in our TL. If I can order my object properties, I put them in the sequence according to and, and, and uh, according to certain rules. And that sequence should not contradict what uh, the transitive closure of your uh, subproperty axis. So, for example, you said in your ontology, you said uh, you said something like F R uh, composed with S. Oh, not even that. Let's make it really simple. Okay, and S is a subproperty of uh, T. Okay, then and T is a subproperty of you know, F. So these are my object properties. So so then the relation reflexive transitive closure relation is built according to this axioms. So you say, okay, R is uh, R and, and S are in this relation. S and T are in this relation. Since so it's a closure, R and uh, T are in this relation, R and F are in this relation, and so on. That, so this is just a completely syntactic notion of, 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 of closure. You can build a mechanic and just go through the list of axioms and just build it. Um, okay. So then your property hierarchy is regular if it satisfies certain restrictions. So first two are simple. They look complicated, but they are actually, actually simple. So you may notice that this is actually transitivity. You say that P is transitive, and that's what you always allow to do. Um, you are always allowed to use top object property on the right hand side of the chain. Reason being that it's just the same as saying nothing. It's like it's the same as saying that person is a subclass of thing, because everything is a sub subclass of thing. Same way everything is a subclass of top object property. 
everything is a sub-property of the object. Property. So the real complicated condition is this one. You need to make sure that you can order all your properties in a way such that if a property like P1, P2, Pn occur on the left hand side of the chain, uh, on, on, on the left hand side of the sub property inclusion action, then it's smaller than what you put on the right hand side. And don't worry about complexity of this definition. I will give you examples. I will show you examples of regular and irregular properties. So you, you, you will be able to see how, what, we, what we can say or we cannot say. So this condition is central, but we, we can also allow so-called left linear or right linear chains. So we can say things like, um, uh, if I have a friend and that friend has an enemy, then I am an enemy. So all enemies of my friends are my enemies. And all, and all friends, um, and all like, enemies of my and these are my friends. Okay, now it's on. Okay, that, that, was, that was a difficult part, but that will hopefully illustrate how it works. So this is an example of what we can say. Regular object property. Uh, regular object property hierarchy. So in the first axiom here, in this example, we have uh, statement, statement saying that if I have a father and that father is a brother, then I, then I have an uncle. That's what you know. If your father has a brother, you have an uncle. Right? If that's me, and you are connected by the father of to someone, and that person, your father, has a brother, then there is a link. As uncle. At the same time, you can say that, okay, if that uncle uh, is married to someone, and someone has a wife, then we not only have an uncle, but also an aunt. And all that part, all that stuff is fine because you can just you can order the raw the properties in this sequence, and you can see, okay, father has to be sm smaller than uncle. That's fine. Because father here and uncle there. Brother has to be smaller than uncle. That's also true. Uncle has to be smaller than uh, uncle in law. It's true. Same with wife. So the linear order exists. That means the hierarchy is critical. Another example. Maybe less obvious. So here we say that. Well, that might be an example of a bad model then. I, I, I don't think that's strictly speaking true from common sense. But what, we, what I've said here is that if you have a parent, and that parent uh, is married to someone, and that someone has its own parent, then you have a grand parent. Well, let's, let's assume in our domain people don't get divorced and married to someone else after you are born. So let's just simplify things. So, and then so it looks like this. You have a father. Uh, you have a parent actually. That parent is married to someone, has spouse. So that so it's also your parent, by the way, just to model that. And that someone someone else is as a parent. Then you have a grandparent. That's what I've said there. And it's still regular. Because there is an order. Parent is smaller than grandparent, spouse is smaller than grandparent. No problem. Now, a couple of examples of what you cannot say. So this is just a canonical example which occurs, uh, which you can find in many places, including the spec of the language. So what you cannot say is, soon you have the same uh, chain uh, and the uh, inclusion axiom saying that um, Brother of your father is your uncle. What you can also say is, okay, if if I have a child and that child has an uncle, that means I have a brother. Is, it, is, it, is everyone okay with that? Uh, if your if your kid if your child has an uncle. Uh, 
then then that that means you have a split. Uh, well, at least the way it's modeled here. And uh, and that is a problem because there's there's no way how we can put all these object properties in, in in a sequence such that father and brother will be smaller than uncle and child and uncle will be smaller than the brother. And the conflicting pair here is really uncle and brother. So brother has to be smaller than uncle because brother occurs on the left hand side and, and, and uncle on the right hand side. But according to the second axiom, uncle has to be now brother has to be bigger than uncle. So things go wrong here. You, you, you cannot say now to yell that. Another example is uh, well I failed to uh, meaningful to name those things in a meaningful way, but if you have a hierarchy P composed with S composed with R implies S, that's another example of uh, irregular uh, property hierarchy because S cannot be smaller by itself. It's a street folder. Okay. Are you still okay? Are you, are you, are you, so I, I, when I was designing this stuff, I was, I was worried that I'll probably lose like at least half, half of the people at this point. So don't worry too much. It's very rare. It's very rare that you, that you have to go through ontology and, and really trying to find where you violated the syntactic restriction in your ontology. Fortunately, APIs will do that for you. So like, uh, the R API has a profile checker. So the tool will go through your uh, what you've written and tell you where exactly you crossed the border. So you can you, you can go fix things, and the rest is going to be easier. So that, that was the, the hardest point in, in the lecture. So uh, if you're still okay, then then the, the rest is easier, and the rest is going to be about modeling, and we will see where in that modeling. This full, all full stuff actually matters. Why I spend more than a half of the second part just talking about that thing? Okay, so L2 is not a silver bullet. It's not a language that can represent everything and solve all your modeling problems for all kinds of applications and domains. If that's your hope, you're wrong. It's not what's going to happen. And there are areas which have been identified which are particularly problematic for all. Uh, so for example, if you want to talk about time, if you want to talk about uncertainty, if, it, if you want to express knowledge which is not first order. So I will, I will spend most of time talking about that. Um, or if you want to express something which is, which is first order, but it's not in a compatible fragment of the world. So if you want something which is like every pretty bit, then you're going to you need some sort of tricks and workarounds that you will not be able to use directly. So I will start with easy stuff. So every pretty bit. Do you understand the term Henry? Henry. What's the difference between binary and Henry? Does that, is that clear to everyone? So for example, a relation where with only two components is called binary, as child, there's only just one. So it's a set of pairs. Right? And every relation is a set of tuples. Right? So for example, how do we say that Stewie has a high but falling temperature? So there are several uh, objects now involved into this relation. We have Stewie, not just Stewie in temperature, uh, in temperature we have still a high falling temperature. Or we want to say that Megan bought a book from uh, bought a book A from store B. We have concepts of it. We have individual, we have two stores, we have a book. Or we want to say that Lois knew that several airports in a single trip. So a typical way of doing this, since you cannot say directly that you know that the relation as a tree uh, is interpreted as an as any relationship uh, over cities, which this tree expands. You have to work around it, and the approach is the same. And uh, typically, introduce classes which work with reifier. 
Refine means that you may you take something which is not a concept, which is actually an enderly predicate, and uh, turn it into concept. So, so we are trying to formalize Stewie has a high temperature by falling temperature. So if you just if you just say that Stewie has a high temperature, Stewie has a fall uh, has a falling temperature, then oh, oh, it's not clear whether we are still talking about the same temperature. Or so what you do instead, you introduce a class temperature observation for student, and you say that we have a temperature observation for student. We observe a certain temperature for student, which is which, ha, which is related to high by S value. That temperature observation is high, but it has a trend. It's lower. It's going down. It's falling. And uh, due to property chains and now we can actually capture the semantics of that much pretty uh, accurately by saying that okay if you have temperature uh, which has a trend then you have a te certain trend in temperature that makes it easier for applications to work with this data so modeling what you what we need to model something which is entering I don't expect to remember the exact approach but I want you to keep in mind okay I've heard about that some time. I know that people have thought about that before myself, and, I, and there's probably some stuff written up somewhere about that. And that 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 that, that should be a take-home message from this lecture. So, because I'm sure all of you will be able to dig it up and understand. It's not complicated. But you just need to know that it exists. Oh, so that that's the best part. That's the favorite part of the and and, and the last complicated part of this lecture. And the last part of this lecture at all, at all I think. Looking at time. It's a meta modeling. Suppose you have a class hierarchy of birds. You say that eagle is a subclass of bird and the bald eagle, bald eagle is a subclass of birds, and you have a particular bald eagle named Harry. Alpha meter so far. Should be. Simple taxonomy. But when you, what you want to model, really, you want to model that certain birds are in danger of extinction. So you, you want to say that um, a class of endangered species is a subclass of species, and you want to say that the bald eagle is actually in danger, probably at least in some red book. So you should not, should not be able to hunt bald eagles. I'm actually not sure whether the bald eagles are in danger, but in this domain I don't care. I, I assume they are, because lots of eagles are in danger. Even if they are not, at all, they might be in some way. Okay? So my question to you is, uh, how, how do we formalize the relationship between the concept of bald eagles and the concept of endangered species? Uh, and, and, I, and I don't really expect you to provide an answer, because um, first of all, we don't have time for that. And the second, because well, it's um, it's not really trivial. But what you can observe here is that if you just say the bald eagle is a subclass of endangered species, because that's that's what most natural thing seems natural, right? You just say, okay, all bald eagles are endangered species, and um, what happens if, it, if I do just that? Maybe the simple thing works. Um, well, what happens in this case if you make the bald eagle, if you make this link actually a subclass relationship? Now what happens is Harry becomes an instance of endangered species. Um, but it's not true. If, if Harry is a perfectly healthy eagle and by itself as a, 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 as, as a bird, a single bird, it's not in danger. It, 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 it lives well. Endangered species. Cool. species. That will be the next thing. And the next thing via transitivity to a subclass relationship, you would also infer that Harry is a species and then just outright wrong. End of story. Harry is not a species. Only, uh, only classes are species, but not individuals. And of course, if you go through the red book, you will, not, you will never find Harry in there. Okay? So what happens here is that species in endangered are, should not be modeled as classes of objects. They should be modeled as classes of classes. 
of their metaclasses. And the situation where we need to make statements not about specific objects, but about the classes of objects or about relationship between objects <coughs> is called, called meta-model. We should understand the concept of meta. Statements about objects are just statements. Statements about statements are meta statements. Science about science is meta science. They're all familiar. So meta model is, 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 is this kind of thing. We need to model knowledge about knowledge. How do you do that in the first order of language? Which how to do that? Um, well, if, if you were an alpha, if alpha was, was what, what, what you have, then it's easy. You just you, you take the class assertions and you put bold eagle right in the subject position. Perfect about constructing an idea and an alpha. No problem. But in our deal, we know that uh, you cannot make uh, classes instances of, of anything. Something can be instance of the class, but the class cannot be an instance of anything else. Because it's a first order. You cannot make statements for other. Right? You cannot say that uh, bald eagle is, is an instance of the major species. So it seems that there is something that our pool allows you to do, which our to dl does not allow you to do. And you know already that there are bad things about, about our pool is undecidable, the reasoning is difficult, or support is crap. So, but it seems that there is something nice about that, something really attractive. So how, how, how can we bring that, that feature? Can, can we bring that feature into dl and still use our familiar tools? This is why I went through the pain of explaining what alpha is. So let's see how alpha will actually differs from alpha to DL. Well, first of all, we can use the built-in vocabulary in, in, in any kind of position. But we don't we're not interested in that. We don't we don't we don't want accents like our DF type or DF type or DF type. That doesn't seem to help many more than. Um, well, there's no decidability restrictions. But it's not clear that those, if you leave those, it would help the meta model. But what it actually allows you to do, as I said, it does not separate the set of entities into those which occur only as classes, into those which occur only as properties, or as individual. Remember I said in the first part that you have to declare your entities and out to deal, you have to say that person is a class, you have to say that um, um, is married to is an object property. You have to say that as tax ID is a data property. You have to, you have to enforce that separation before you can do things in alpha DL. But not in alpha full. Declarations are not necessarily now to full at all. So it seems that we just need the second thing in alpha DL. Can we have it and still be desirable? And because if we can have that, then we'll have that modeling. And if that's true, then we can just forget about alpha full forever. Hopefully. Uh, so let's see, okay, we know that alpha full is, is uh, undecidable because there are no restrictions like property hierarchies or cardinality restrictions on complex properties. Um, but we forget about that. And our question is, is if we extend how to deal such that we can make things, make statements like uh, all equals are uh, endangered, will that be decidable? Or if we allow the building vocabulary? Well, there are good news and bad news. Bad news is that it will still not be decidable. But the good news is that it's not, it's not going to be decidable t to 1. Not necessarily t to 2, we don't know at this point. I don't know. There we go. So we know that if you, just, if you allow the use of building vocabulary in l 2 dl then that language is provably undecidable. That has been found not so, not so long time ago, like five years ago. But, again, we don't need this. Who wants this kind of accents? I don't see any immediate value from it. So the question is, if we just allow two, are we okay? Or are we stepping onto the dark side? <coughs> so, and uh, again, smart people didn't search on that. So there are two particular beautiful results which I briefly talk, uh, talk about. One by Boris Motor from Oxford back in 2007 and another by Robert Kebal uh, in 2010, which show you what you have to change in our DL to have some support of that model. Um, which time do we have? 
Okay, I'm here, all right. Okay. So first, let's see if we can extend the semantic foundations of our and support method model. And uh, there are two things you can do. The first thing is what actually support an RTTL, by and large, called contextual semantics, <coughs> or hanging with entities. So what you can do is you can use the same name in both class position and individual position. So you, you actually can say that both ball equal is, uh, is an instance of endangered species and curry is an instance of ball equal. But the thing is, they're going to interpret uh, a ball equal differently depending on how to you, you use it syntactically. If you use that thing as a class, and it's going to be a class, you can think of it as a, using a, a fresh name with the occurrences of that thing as a class. If you use bold equal as a class, then it's a class. If you use bold equal as an instance, to say that it's an instance of endangered species, then it's an instance. Just by looking at the actions, you can always see how you use this class. So if you're familiar with like, maybe type inference uh, in certain languages, or like dynamic typing, so that, that, that's similar. Depending on how you use a variable, it can be a different type. So, it's simple, but the problem is that it doesn't really help. Even though you can model what you want to model, you don't get the entailments which you want to get. And the entailment we want to get in this example, if you say that endangered, uh, endangered species should not be hunted, your entailment should be, please do not hunt carry. Do not go and should hurry down because you want it, because carry is actually an instance of the class which has been put in the red book. That's the entailment you want. And you don't get this in this case. All right, so we can go further. And we can say, OK, so maybe if we do something more, if we, if we do something in our full kind of style, maybe, maybe then we will get that entailment. So now we start tweaking the semantics which, such that you can observe, by the way, that the first way of doing things it's not attached to semantics at all. So I didn't talk about the interpretations and how the interpretation of a class would differ if that class occurs as an instance or as a class. Not attached to that at all because it did not change. Now let's go and change it. So we said, okay, like an outfold, we associate uh, the class bold eagle with its element, but then the identity element. So, so we can actually use that class in a, so when we use this, that class as a, as a, when we say that it's an instance of something else, we actually have an object, which is an instance of something else. So now we tweak the semantics, we tweak our interpretation function, which first maps classes to elements of the domain, and that is extended to a proper subset. And I will show you the picture so you will see how that works. So the difference, the contextual component semantics and the high level semantics. So syntactically we just use the term bold equal. That's our syntax. We can use it in axioms. Semantically the difference is that in a contextual model it can be interpreted as an instance or a class depending on how you use it. But see there are no relationship between these two uh, things. It can be inside, it can be outside, it can be anywhere. They not, they do not interact, which intuitively is the reason we don't get any, any, any talent. Here, in the very powerful style, we first interpret bold eagle as a distinct, uh, as, a, as, a, as an element of the domain, and then we extend that element to a proper, to a subset. So now we introduce the interaction between between the um, between the interpretation of that class as a class and interpretation of that class as an individual. The question is, does it help? Well, it, uh, okay, I should be sliding there, which is missing, but I, I, I'll, I'll explain. So, the problem is that it does help. But, to actually see that it helps and materialize that help into the desirable intelligence that do not hurry, you need an extra support in your language. You need, so you can, for, for example, if you had rules, you could say, if you are an instance of a class, 
and that class is, a, is an instance of another class, then we should not be hunted. So the, the rule works like this. If, if you have, like, that's your variable, if you say that, okay, if p is true about the variable, and that p means endangered, then, so I know there are people in the room who like rules, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm giving an example of the rule here. Then, uh, do not count x. So you could actually use that kind of stuff with your, uh, with the uh, high level semantics. That it would capture exactly the kind of entailment you want. You would be able to entail that the curry should not be hunted. But the problem is that you do not have rules automatically. And uh, to combine rules with how is a very non trivial thing. Marcus is the, is the person to talk about that. Combinations of how and rules. Like, so, a few PhD things were written on the subject, including Marcus. All right, so can we actually do better than that? So, well, maybe not better, but at least with less effort. Because rules do it. It's not bad. Almost as bad as our fault. Okay, so it turns out that, as we know now, what we didn't know three years ago, so this is a very fresh topic, by the way. You can axiomatize semantic modeling directly in our DL. Or at least some, some of it. Some of it. Let's, let, let's be careful. Okay, so what you do in this case, you're extending the category. You introduce new classes like instance and class. You introduce new properties like type subplot, subclass of, or instance of relation. And you see those somehow mirror the standard, the standard built in vocabulary, at least on our DF side. So what happens is you're building in conceptualizing a meta layer inside your ontology. So using the same vocabulary, you can actually say that, okay, these classes are meta classes, should be treated differently. This relationship is a, is a meta relationship, should be treated differently. And you describe how they should behave, not using any rules, not using any, not using any semantic changes. You describe it explicitly using axioms. So, Again, I don't have space and time here to explain the full automatization. I'm just giving you an intuition how that works. So first we say, okay, we are building a meta layer. And as, as always, if you introduce some new stuff into your ontology, which is introduced for some special purposes, not, not for abuse, you don't want that stuff to break things. Like if you had an entailment, you had an entailment that the like, car is bird. You don't want that. You, you, you don't want anything else there. You don't want to get any new talent about a bird just because you introduce some meta model class. So you, you, you first se separate that meta layer from the rest of your ontology. And that's what the first action does. It says all objects which are indicated as instances are disjoint from those which are classes. Okay. Then you explicitly uh, say that, okay, now if you have a class like ball eagle, if you have a class, then somewhere you have an object, now it's syntactic. So then you have a syntactic named object uh, called an identity of this class. So now you say that you provide it explicitly between class as a class and class as an object. Exactly what which we, which we did not have in the, in the public semantics. In the public semantics, they are entirely different. Ball equals a class, ball equals an instance, no, no, no interaction. Here, they are linked, but that link is, is it, and it, it, it's explicitly linked in, uh, using axioms. And then you do stuff like this, and you say, okay, now you introduce another property, which is called subclass of, and which relates classes and these instances to actual, to other classes and these instances. 
for example, this should be an identity element for the class Eagle. See what happens here? I'm building a meta knowledge about my class hierarchy. But not by tweaking semantics or not by uh, hunting. I'm building it explicitly using our lessons. And you can build it all, you can, you can build a nice interface, hide all this stuff. So to the, if you just look, come and look into your ontology, don't really see this, these things. They just, they, they just exist. You can say, so when you, when you mark this, uh, endangered species as a, as, a, as a meta class, then it builds this complex thingy. You, you don't see it. So what happens now? So the model structure of this thing looks like that. So you have just number classes in your in your model structure. Bold eagle and eagle, and you can see the bold eagle is subsumed by eagle uh, as you want because you define them, you, you define axioms which say this. But also on the meta layer. You have something else, you have meta knowledge about it, which actually reflects, mirrors what you said in, um, in, in, in your ontology. And the reason you have that is because uh, you can do meta reasoning now. So you can do reasoning about this part, which is automatically synchronized with the class hierarchy of your, of your ontology. And, uh, and you can get the entailment you want. Well, this is an example. You can get the entailment that if something is a member of a class which is endangered, which is a member of endangered species, then that, that object should not be hunted. Do not hunt curry. Um, so you, you couldn't do it in contextual semantics, you could do it in high semantics but with extra stuff, and you can do it in this axiomatization without extra stuff. Uh, well, without um, any stuff which is outside LTL. So, the way it works here is, is the following. In your meta layer, you have, you have this link, uh, this one, which is there because, because, you, because your class hierarchy is automatically synchronized with the meta layer by means of uh, axiomatization. You have something else. You have a statement which, which says if you are a member of endangered species, then you should not be hunted. Um, and since that axiomatization actually allows us to infer that uh, bald eagle is a uh, so the, the inference goes from Harry to Bald Eagle. Harry is connected to Bald Eagle. Uh, because it's, it's an instance of Bald Eagle. And Bald Eagle, the identity of Bald Eagle is now connected to the list of to the concept in danger. By the role chain you get the inference that Harry should not be common. So I know it looks complicated, but I just show how that, that you can actually how two is actually powerful enough to Sometimes do things like that. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there is a downside, of course. You have a lot of extra stuff in your ontology. It brings a lot of uh, overhead. So it doesn't come for free. You cannot use it in any profiles. And the experiments show that it's pretty slow at the moment. But the, the, the expressivity is there. You can actually do these things. Because the speed will increase later, as we know from the history. Uh, well, not the most successful project. So in mind, at least you have the foundations. Yes, sure. How can we connect both people as a class and both people and something else? Yeah, okay, so that what's the relation? The relation is that when you build a meta layer, you so those axioms are added. So for every named class in your ontology, there is automatically an identity element for that class, which is linked to that class. And for every named property, there is an identity element for that property. So your, your ontology becomes bigger linearly. So for every 
So I skip, I skip that, so it, it's a part of this axiomatization actually. So I just show the part of the here, but there, there's a lot more. There's a lot more. So for every class, there's an identity element, which is linked to the class. For every relationship, there's an identity element. If something, if something, um, this says that, uh, where am I? Okay, so see, so this is the axiom which exactly relates classes and identity elements. Uh, classes and elements. So it, it says that so these ranges over all main classes. So for every main class in your ontology, it is true that uh, that it's made on the elements of that class. So see things which are normally just defined semantically, here you have to axiomatize. Because you're going to reflect the structure of your ontology on the mental layer. So it's not easy. This, this the, the, the basic code is not straightforward, but you have to do pretty interesting things. So all those things which are missing in the previous uh, kind of semantics now made explicit here. And that's, I believe, uh, uh, I, oh, so I just wanted to say about the performance is that since you're, in this case, the only implementations are done by taking the ontology and translating it yeah. into this larger ontology and then running that much larger thing on the reasoner. It's kind of like running an interpreter. The, the reasoner doesn't know anything about the meta level and it can't do any real tricks on it. It just knows that it's handling a very large, kind of complicated ontology. And so this sort of naturally tends to be Because you remember what I was talking about yesterday, that when reasoner does proofs, it has nothing, it doesn't know what all those things mean. It's just, names don't matter. So if you have an axiom which is a meta axiom or an axiom which is an axiom, they're just both axioms. You have one small collection of axioms, now it's blown into a bigger collection of axioms with, with uh, some... Um, so for example, if in your ontology you did not use all values from, now it's going to be there because uh, on the meta layer we need all values from. Well, so as you go, behavior kicks in, you pay extra price. Even though, you know, it's not, it's not real model, it's meta modeling, but for reason that all for a reason that all those axes are just all look the same. They're all DL, DL axes. It will go into Tableau, the consequence base, or Tableau in this case. Um, and, uh, well, it will pay the price. But you'll get the intelligence. So it's always, the whole, the, the, the whole story of modeling is always, almost always, a story of finding the balance between what you want to get and how long you're going to wait. If you can't wait long enough, well, then you're leaving it on what you can say. If you don't care, you use more features. If you don't care at all, you use all four. Or you use some unrestricted rule language. Um, okay, so I'm going to finish probably... Uh, yes, in five minutes I'll just show you another example of where this stuff is in the house. Another example of map modeling. So let's see we have an, Let's assume we have an ontology about animals, particular lines. We say that lion is an animal and African lion is a particular bundle of lines in Africa. Okay? Same thing to do. And now, what we want? We want to model books about lines. So we have a concept of a book and we have three instances of books. We have, a, we have a book about lines in general called Lines, Life and the Pride. And we have a book about African lines called that the line. Again, the same question. What should be the relationship between this individual, a book, and, and this concept, and this individual, another book, and this concept? And it's the exact same situation. So I'm going through this thing to help you recognize those situations in the future if you ever encounter them. See, your book is not, is not about any particular line. It's, it's, the book is about the line as a concept. And the other book is about the African line as a concept. So you cannot just say, okay, let's relate this to, let's just say, an object property assertion where uh, this is the first component of the object property, then the source, and then the target of the object property. Classes cannot be, cannot be linked by property values, cannot occur in object property assertions in DL. 
Can unfold. Can be full. But it doesn't want full. Or may not want full. So what you so what happens in reality, since people don't do that modeling, which is not common, so so this is one kind of solution in quotes, but what people actually do. They they just mirror the hierarchy of lines with another hierarchy. But as, as a hierarchy of subjects of possible books. Um, and then they say, okay, uh, they have some annotation properties. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so, okay. So we have a parallel hierarchy of subjects. And now we can say that this book has a relationship to some subject. Some specific subject, which is the subject about lines. And the subject about lines, you relate that class to lines. So it's, it's, it, it, it's an indirection. There's an obvious maintenance of a path here. You have to keep those hierarchies in sync. Uh, but the only other option is either use annotations or it's all full. Uh, and I'm going to skip the rest because I don't have time, but I think I covered what I wanted to cover mostly. That's why I put it up wrong. And uh, the rest you can just read my slides and uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to take it now or tomorrow or whatever until then do it. Any questions? Because I'm going to stop. And I really wanted to stop it. <laughs> this must be. Or should it? I am I actually uh, I have a privilege to you know, ignore uh, comments of certain members of the crowd, which I would like to use. Alright, so any questions? So as I as I promised the first half is more or less obvious and reflection by law by law before the second part will be not real. But and then that's what happens. And uh, since I only showed the some unfortunate cases for modeling, you shouldn't be worried too much because tomorrow we'll see the positive cases of our modeling where all actually works nice and smooth and gives you exactly what you wanted and in reasonable times. And those cases are pretty bad. So more of those cases can go as far as you say that. Alright? If you don't, if you don't have questions, then we just uh, stop. <laughs>